Hello everyone and welcome to the Constructed Criticism Network. This network is here to help you improve in Magic the Gathering at every level. From popper leagues to top 1000 mythic, we've got you covered. If you want to hear the entire network, head on over to our sponsor at puremtgo.com where you can hear each and every show, each and every week, and check out their sponsor, MTGO Traders, and tell them that the CCMTG Network sent you. Now sit back, enjoy the show, from YouTube, podcasts, and more, here's this week's episode from ConstructedCriticism.com. Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 109 of the Common Knowledge Podcast. I'm your host, Christian, and I'm joined by our co-host, Brad. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going pretty well, Brad. How are you? Good. Good, good, good. I know we talked about it a little bit in the pre-episode, but I busted my finger, smashed it pretty good, so um, I'm hobbling along one-handed right now, but I think I'll get through it. Yeah, well... I, I certainly hope you're able to. That is um, very unfortunate, especially given the state of the world. <laughs> yeah, it's not like I type all day or anything. <clears throat> right. Um, so before we got too far into this episode, I just want to remind everyone that Common Knowledge and all of the podcasts on the Constructive Criticism Network are sponsored by PureMTGO.com. If you guys wanted to support the show, you make sure to like, share, and subscribe to the Constructive Criticism YouTube channel and check out our Patreon. With that out of the way, let's get on to the podcast for the week. All right. Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> I guess first, um, Brad and I just sort of wanted to talk about um, sort of the plans for the next couple of weeks, as well as like 2021 as a whole. Um, so, the first thing that I sort of wanted to announce is um, the next episode that we record, <clears throat> episode 110. We were wanting to do a giveaway of um, probably about 10 tickets to two different people. So to enter in it, you guys can tag um, either one of us or the podcast network with just like a Christmas themed popper deck. Right, right on Twitter, right? Yeah. Um, and Brad and I will either pick one each or pick two together to just send you some tickets over to based on the ones that we think are the most creative or the ones that we like the most, um, anything like that. Yeah, this is pretty much going to be a, an aesthetics only sort of competition where, you know, it's not going to be any sort of tournament or structured event. You're just going to send us decks. And if they look cool and they look fun, they look pretty, you're going to get some ticks. Yeah, exactly. And then um, we have a lot more planned in um, 2021. As for, um, <clears throat> like, Brad has been hosting the uh, Battle of the Brews, the Popper Singleton stuff that I really wanted to get involved in somehow. Um, we were wanting to do more giveaways in 2021, have a lot of guests on, as well as sometime early in January, we're going to revamp the whole Patreon and try and keep up with that a little bit better. Yeah, I'm excited about that. We have actually got a couple guests lined up already. We just haven't got them officially on the schedule yet. Yeah. So yeah. that's going to be pretty awesome. Yeah, so there's a lot of exciting stuff coming up in uh, 2021 i think i'm very excited about it and brad might be even more excited than i am <laughs> which is um, hard to do um, and if that's the case then i know everyone else is probably also very excited yeah i've gotten a lot of good feedback so far on our our little adventure here so um i only see good things going forward next year yeah so um <clears throat> if you guys had any questions about anything you can um either shoot us an email or again reach out on twitter is probably the best way <laughs> Because I know that I somewhat live on there in my off hours. So, yeah, uh, same here. <laughs> so, yeah, if you guys have any questions or concerns about any stuff like that or about pretty much anything in general, you can always. Yeah, if you ever just want to chat, you know, anything really. Um, like he said, I'm always on Twitter. Twitter and Discord are where I get most of my notifications from. So, either one of those places, you can pretty much always reach me. stuff and i guess um with that out of the way we can uh go ahead and move on to the decks that we've been playing for the past week um if you wanted to lead us off brad sure um well it is getting towards the end, middle end of december i honestly have not been playing too much i usually get online on mtgo uh, four or five times a week just to you know, mess around and brew decks and hand out ticks or whatever I'm doing, but I haven't actually had a lot of time to play. Um, I did make a white red heroic list using champion of the flame. I don't know that that's the right home for him yet. It was basically heroic splashing mountains and, um, a four of champion of the flame. 
it didn't turn out great. I played it a couple times. I wasn't really impressed with it. I don't think that's the right home for him. But um, he's definitely right up my alley. I love that kind of card. You know, he, he gets buffed every time you put a equipment on him or an aura on him. And that's generally what I like to play. I've seen a lot of equipment heavy brews that use him and the Goblin Gavalier, who also gets a buff with each in, uh, equipment. But I just I haven't had any luck with it. Um, yeah, um, for our viewers that don't know, Champion of the Flame <clears throat> is a two converted mana cost creature, uh, one generic and one red. It's a one one with trample, and it gets plus two plus two for each aura and equipment on it. Yeah, yeah. I guess I could have read that for him. Sorry. <laughs> Not a big deal. I'm sure most people knew what it did, but just for anyone that didn't. And then also, since I mentioned it, um, Goblin Gavalier follow, falls kind of in that same vein. Um, it's a one, just a single red mana for a Goblin Warrior. He's a 1-1. One, one. He also has Trample, and Goblin Gavalier gets plus two, plus zero for each equipment attached to it. Uh, my only problem with running both of these in the deck was that it seemed a little... I guess cannibalistic to have one equipment on the table and not sure which creature to give it to in any given situation. Um, but I do think there's a correct brew that involves both of those. I'm just not, I'm not there yet. Yeah, no, that uh, sounds like tons of fun. That'd be something that I'd be um, pretty interested in playing around with um, either like whenever paper tournaments start back, like in the, yeah. like a more local meta. So you can sort of refine it to figure out like what types of decks it beats or just running it into the wall that is moto over. And over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, I've had exact, I've had exactly one victory with it and that was against um, the mono blue mill with Jace's erasure and um, Jace's phantasm and just real slow mill cards, you know, thought scour and all that. Um, pretty much the, uh, the net deck you find whenever you type in MTG Popper Mill, it's the one that comes up. So, well, for me, um, <clears throat> my uh, main job is working in a retail store. So around this time of year, everything is um, obviously super crazy. Trying to yeah. both get things ready for the new year as well as do all of the holiday events at the same time. So I also haven't been playing too much this past week. Um, <clears throat> I've mostly just been theorizing over Reanimator. Um, there was a 5-0 in the last league results that I saw. That was like a Brixis Reanimator deck. Um, <clears throat> you and I talked about it some, and I think you posted about it on Twitter. Um, it has like pieces of the puzzle and stuff like that, which is yeah, I'm gonna... like a tech that I never considered, even though it does everything that you want because it puts not instants in, like into your graveyard. And then it puts um, Exhum into your hand. So, and it's like, that's the best of all worlds. So, Yeah, I pulled up the deck list here. Um, yeah, it, it wasn't... It, it's a um, deck tech that I never really thought of either. Um, but yeah, it's... Uh, who is the pilot on this one? Milk with two Ks. Uh, Goldfish just has it as UBR... I guess they're not really recognizing that it's just mainly... I'm not sure how their naming system works, but um, you're right. It is just black, red, reanimator, splashing blue. I dropped the link in there if you wanted to pull it up as well, Christian. Yeah, um, um, I'll just run through the whole list real fast. So they're playing yeah, yeah, you're definitely more familiar with this archetype than I am, so I feel that you should uh, take the reins on it. Yeah, so they're playing... Um, <clears throat> I'll just do the creature package. There you have the four standard Ulamog's Crusher, um, which is an eight mana Eldrazi with an Annihilator two. Um, it's an eight eight, and it attacks each turn a Fable. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty strong. Um, it's pretty common that you bring that back with one of the four Dragon Breath, which is a two mana enchantment. Um, it gives enchanted creature haste. But the real thing is that whenever a creature with converted mana cost six or more comes into play, you can return it from your graveyard to play enchanting that creature. So if you combine those two cards in your graveyard with Exhum, basically you have an 8-8 eight eight with Haste and Annihilator 2. That's, that's broken. Um, so that's sort of like the main combo there. And then, of course, to supplement that, we have two Stinkweed Imp as just another creature that you don't mind putting into your graveyard. 
Um, I always really enjoyed Stinkweed Impt when I was playing Black Red Reanimator because it was like um, it was this weird grindy option since most of Popper is centered around creature combat. Right. It um, costs three mana, two generic, and a black. It's a one-two flyer, and whenever it deals combat damage to a creature, you destroy that creature, and then it also has dredge five. So it's like, um, you know, you can keep playing this card to keep answering their creatures or at least prevent them from attacking with the creatures that matter. And then every time it dies, you get to put more creatures into your graveyard, um, sort of furthering your game plan that way. So to me, this was always a nice grindy option, even though I'm pretty sure most people just read it and see the dredge five. Right. And then to round out the creatures, they have three Gurmag Angler, which is um, sort of probably one of, if not the best creature in Popper. Um, you know, it, the best you know, non-monarch creature in Popper. Yes. Yeah, it uh, sort of just does everything that you want because you're filling up your graveyard. So oftentimes it's just one black for a five-five. Um. So I, <clears throat> I also just think that that's um, just a great card. And then the cards that I was really interested in were they were playing Careful Study, which is um, it's Faithless Looting without the flashback. Um, but instead of costing one red mana, it costs a blue mana. And they were playing four of those in addition to your Faithless Looting. And that, to me, seemed like um, a great idea, tons of fun, more ways to get the right cards into your graveyard, more card selection, pretty much everything that you wanted. Because um, ideally, sorry to interrupt, um, I've never really played this deck before, but ideally in your first one or two turns, you want a Looting, I guess, or a Careful Study, a crusher, a dragon's breath, and an exhume somehow in that in that pattern, right? I mean that's the whole that's the whole thing. Exactly, yeah. Um, against the vast majority of decks, you know, you want to play your faithless looting or careful study, put Ulamog's Crusher and maybe Dragon's Breath into your graveyard, and then your next turn you wanna put your Ulamog's Crusher into play. Um, with Exhume. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, turn two hasty crusher is pretty much uh, a good game very rarely not and so careful study as just another copy of faithless looting is just a really good way to do that yeah it's that rule of eight that a lot of people talk about you know you want pretty much eight effects of one particular thing and yeah i never even considered that before but that looks like what they're doing here <clears throat> and it looks like um the next eight cards sort of in the spell category are ponder and preordain which I really like. It's not something that I would have considered, but I am now, just because, you know, the, it's the two best card selection cards in Popper. And whenever you're playing a deck that you want to have, you know, three or at least two uh, particular cards in your hand, having the best card selection available to you possible is probably something very important. Yeah. Um, so playing four Ponder, four Preordain seems very straightforward, very good. Um, then, of course, you have the four exhume. That is um, two mana, generic, and a black. It puts a creature card from the graveyard onto the battlefield. Each player does that, though. So um, that's something that you usually want to get off before they have good creatures in their graveyard. Yeah, it's excellent turn two. It's not so great turn six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and then, again, the aforementioned four pieces of the puzzle. Um, reveal the top five cards of your library, put two instants and or sorcery cards from among them into your hand, and the rest into your graveyard. So you can put your Ulamog's Crusher into the graveyard and your Exhum into your hand all at the same time. It's uh, something that's, that's brutal. <laughs> that's, that's pretty strong. I don't know. I guess I haven't followed this archetype a whole lot. Is, is Lotus Petal something you normally see in this list? Yeah, so Lotus Petal to me, um, that's, um, for people that don't know, it's just a zero mana artifact that's like a one shot of a mana of any color. You just... It's a treasure token. Sorry? It's a treasure token. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's it's something that I at least played a lot, and I know a lot of other people did as well. Um, so one of the things oftentimes, when I was playing Red Black, for example, um, if the meta was a little bit more aggressive, sometimes you wouldn't even be trying to combo off in the early turns because, like, um, let's say that you didn't have all the combo pieces in your hand and you mulligan some. Lotus Petal allowed you to answer what they were doing while using your mana from your lands to still cast the cards that you felt necessary, like your Faithless Lootings or your Stinkweed Imps or anything like that. 
Okay, so it's doing exactly what you want it to do. I mean, it's it, it's there for the free mana. There's no artifact shenanigans or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I will say Lotus Petal is far and away probably one of the most expensive cards in Popper. Um, for the play set, it's about 66 tickets. I don't yep. think it's necessary to win with this archetype. That, yeah, that was going to be my next question. Yeah. So you could definitely cut it. Um, if I were to cut Lotus Petal, I'd probably play like um, a few Lightning Axes or a few Lightning Bolts, something like that, um, and just continue moving on with my day. Um, you okay. would definitely miss it, but I think if you had ways to slow down your opponent, you would miss it less. Could you get away with swapping the Lotus Petal for Simeon Spirit Guides? Granted, you only get the red mana, but... Probably if you were playing like a red-black deck, yes. This one is very blue-heavy. Um, there are a lot of blue pips in this deck. There are more blue yeah. pips than red pips. Yeah, I was just looking at that. Yeah, so I'm not sure you could do that in a Grixis build. Okay, that makes sense. Red -black. And then, of course, you just have 19 lands. There's two Bajuka Bog here. The Thriving Lands make appearances, which I like a lot. Yeah. Um, and then the sideboard is pretty straightforward. You have Red Elemental Blast, Pyroblast, Hydroblast, Duress, Fiery Cannonade, um, basically anything that you could want. Is this a pretty stock sideboard list for a deck like this? Yeah. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't, to me, anyway, it doesn't look like it's targeting one specific bad matchup. Yeah, it's more or less kind of covering the board exactly. or the field. So when I, again, I haven't played the Grixis, but when I, when I was playing Red Black, um, what I would always look to do is I would have a really diverse sideboard for a lot of matchups, but then sort of what's missing out of this sideboard, and I'd be interested to talk to the pilot about it, is um, I would also have like grindy ways for post-board games when people are bringing in stuff like Graveyard Hate, um, or more like removal that could kill an Oodlemonk's Crusher early or anything like that. I would have ways to grind out the game, like Thorn of the Black Rose, or Crypt Rats, or sometimes both. Um, just, you know, stuff to help games for whenever they go longer, because I think games two and three tend to go longer anyways. And so I would normally bring those in alongside whatever targeted hate that I had for any specific deck. Okay. Um, so I, I'm not entirely sure about the sideboard. I do like the Three of Braid and all the Elemental Blasts and everything like that. Yeah, almost uh, almost half the sideboard is either Hydro, Pyro, or Red or Blue Blasts. Yeah. That's pretty interesting. I, I would just be interested to know sort of um, why they didn't um, include basically anything to help grind. Again, like Thorn of the Black Rose or anything like that. Um, however, and, you know, that could just not be their game plan. They could be just wanting really cheap interaction while they, while they combo off. And I could also see that being a much better plan than what I was doing when I was playing this deck. Sure, sure. What does this type of deck, um, maybe not the Grixis version, because like you said, you haven't really played it. Um, what does Black Red Reanimator typically suffer to? I mean, you don't see it a lot on MTGO. Is it just click intensive or does it actually have horrendous matchups? <clears throat> so far and away um it's actually still probably up on our um patreon when i was playing it i wrote a little bit about the black red deck and i'm pretty sure I, actually i know what i've concluded the deck's probably worst matchup to be is actually boggles um the reason that i actually think this is because you know they can play the graveyard hate and stuff like that yeah and then they're also one of the few decks that have a chance of actually their creatures outclassing an ulamog's crusher Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's nothing to get to a 14, 14, 15, 16, 17 creature. Right, and with if they're able to do that while just slightly delaying your game plan, then all of a sudden, like, they're like, whatever, I'll sacrifice my two lands, gain 15 life, and uh, kill your Ulamog's Crusher. Like, you know, they just don't mind doing that. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would happily be manaless if I had a 15, 15 life link trampler on the board. Exactly. And, uh, so. I guess piggybacking more off that is um, it's interesting because a lot of times what you try and do is just throw your opponents off their game plan slightly while advancing your own. And Boggles got to do that to you because, you know, again, they played like um, just a few places, pieces of graveyard hate to sort of make you work around it. 
while also still having cheap and efficient enough cards to um, just continue to build. And that's not saying that the matchup's unwinnable, because anytime there's a turn one or turn two, basically win built into your deck, you always have a chance. Yeah, sure. Um, another one that was rough was <clears throat> always like Blue Black Delver. Um, if they played um, very, I don't want to say conservatively, I would say more like. Um, Sorry, I'm trying to figure out how to put it. You're fine. And looking through the lists um, of this league, I didn't see a ton of graveyard hate in the sideboards. Mm -hmm. Maybe that contributed to this 5-0. I, you know, I, we don't really know, but yeah. you don't see as many uh, relics as you used to, I guess. Yeah, so that's interesting. That could be in response to um, basically what people think matter um, because it was always interesting, right? Because relics... Not only do they hit the cards with flashback, um, you know, even the like <clears throat> monarch decks were sometimes playing cards like Battle Screech with flashback and stuff like that. They could also slow down Gurmag Anglers. Um, basically, relic and stuff did everything that you want to do. But now I think people are so um, consumed with slowing down both Cascade and um, yes, monarch yes, cards that maybe they forgot that the graveyard is. <laughs> a thing <laughs> of a good popper deck is being able to effectively utilize your graveyard yes yeah, having a second library is is no joke oh the uh, word that i was looking for earlier was disciplined if the blue black player plays a very disciplined game it can be hard to beat them okay but um oftentimes what you see with um fast combo decks like reanimator is um it makes people's brains sort of you know, they're sort of like in panic mode, like, oh, God. Panic like, mode, yeah. Right now? And that can cause them to play a little bit worse, I think. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think um, a lot of combo deck wins based off the mental game. Yeah. You know, the opponents start rushing, or and that's when you get misplays and everything else. Exactly. Um, but, yeah, um, all in all, this is a great, great deck. Um, Milk with two Ks, great job. You've... Um, inspired me and probably a lot of our viewers now so uh thank you for that yeah that's awesome that grixis reanimator is not something i ever thought about yeah. good job <clears throat> so i guess speaking of decks that um i probably could never have thought about we can move on to our main topic nice segue sorry nice segue oh thanks <laughs> um which you hosted something called the Battle of the Brews. Yes. Why don't you talk about what that is for a second? Well, they started, yeah, it's the Battle of the Brews. Um, and we named it that because we didn't just want to hold another free, you know, player run event, 60 card constructed. You know, my whole thing about Popper is brewing and the community. And I wanted to kind of combine those two together to see what we could come up with. Uh, I forgot where the idea originally came from, but I fell in love with the idea of doing um, 60 card singleton constructed popper. Um, as soon as I heard that idea, I was, I was on board. And the very first one we did, I don't know if I could find the link for it now, but uh, we didn't, I don't know if we gave away ticks. We may have given away ticks, but the first place prize was um, a playset of altered Ash Barons. As some one of our followers on Twitter, a member of the Discord, alters cards, and he said, "Hey, I'll donate these to the winner. You know, just let me know." So that was really cool. Um, but that one ended up being so popular that with them, every time there's a new set, um, anytime a influx of popper cards comes into the format, we'll run a new. We'll give everybody a few days to brew with them or what have you. And then we'll generally run another one of these events. Um, and they're pretty insanely popular. You see some creative stuff on there. You always get, you know, great MTGO grinders, full-time grinders on there. Um, and they love it. And, you know, it's a break from the meta. It's a break from the leagues. It's a break from challenges. You know, and it's free. And it, they usually last about a week just to kind of give everybody, because typically the players are all over the world. You know, they're in the United States, South America, um, all over. So, we usually stretch it out over a week or so to give everybody time to schedule their match, get it played, and then we can start the next round. Yeah, um, so specifically hosting the tournament over a course of a week is something that I actually really like about it. Um, 
because I think for a lot of people, what sort of stops them from wanting to do things in a more competitive sense is not feeling like they have the time. Sure. So the fact that somebody, you know, could schedule something, you know, after they get off work or before they go in and, you know, it works with someone else's schedule exactly and no one really has to make a huge sacrifice. Right. Is, um, you can sort of focus on the game and not have to worry about it too much. Exactly. Um, yeah. Because, like, even, like, an FNM or whatever, I'm sure this has happened. It's happened to me plenty. I don't know if it's happened to anyone else where, you know, you show up at FNM and your opponent, you know, like, has to leave early in the match because, you know, something happened at home or anything like that. And this um, format sort of gets around that, I guess, because, you know, if something comes up for somebody, you know, you can always put a plug in it or reschedule for another time. It's something right. that um, helps all parties involved, I think. Yeah, you typically have about 48 hours to get your ma get one match in. Yeah. So, and then... There are times where everybody gets their match done that night that the round starts and we can start the next round the very day, you know, the following day. So it's very fluid. There's nothing too rigid about the schedule. I think this last one that ended, we actually pushed back round five because all the matches couldn't be done in time. So it ended up going an extra day and everybody was fine with it. We didn't really have any problems. <clears throat> Yeah. But you wanted to look at some of the deck lists, right? Yeah. Um, I Looking through it, as soon as I learned about the format and you and I talked about it, I brewed like um, a deck list that I thought would probably be really good in it. <laughs> now that I'm looking over the deck list, I realize that all these people probably have way more of an idea of what's going on than I did. Yeah, at this point we've got... Um, I'm trying to get the guys at Cards Room to actually make a Pupper Singleton meta breakdown. Um, I know it's probably low on their list of priorities, but yeah, a lot of these players have been in since the first one, so they kind of know what to expect. Some of them are brand new, so you get a little bit of everything. Right. Um, I think you and I were talking about some before the show that historically speaking, monocolor decks are sort of like the thing to be doing. Yeah, they're definitely... Um, the most attractive, I think you'll see a lot of multicolored decks from people that have played this before or people that are, oh, I don't know, familiar brewing commander, say, you know, uh, per se, something like that. But um, I know when I, on the on the few times that I've brewed up a singleton list, it's always monocolored. I don't know if just, that's just my mindset or what, but that's where I gravitate towards. And you can kind of see it. Um, on the page here, 20% of the decks that were actually uploaded and registered were mono black. I mean, mono black didn't take the tournament down, but you can kind of see where people's alignment were this time around. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> I don't know, it's interesting. They had mono black was um, the most popular deck. They had just over 50% of a game win percentage. Um, and then, of course, you know, you had the mono white deck. There's a deck that um, is mono blue. There was like a mono red burn deck. Um, so one of the things that I think is appealing about mono color decks is probably just that they sort of build a little bit more straightforward. Because yeah. you, know, if you can make a low to the ground mono color deck, you know, you're probably doing better than um, like brews that have, you know, like six or seven mana cards in it, generally speaking, or something like that. Yeah. It's just sort of something really safe. And then once you know a little bit more about the format, you're sort of able to go from there, I think. Right. And that's pretty much, I, I, yeah, I think that's exactly correct. Um, Monocolored decks are just, like you said, they're more comfortable. You know, you don't have to worry about trying to draw your fetch land or your second color, your third color, fourth color. Um, if you've got 20 mountains in your deck, that's all you've got in your deck. You know, you don't need to worry about... Um, am I going to draw this this forest for this spell or swamp for this spell? Um, but I do, I, I mean, that said, I do enjoy seeing the um, the decks that showed up in this event. You know, there's quite a few three-color decks that um, looked pretty interesting. I know we were looking over them pre-show. Yeah, well, um, for example, there are two decks that both had four wins and a draw. I'm assuming that the two players just intentionally drew against each other and split or something like that. I think it was something like that, yeah. Yeah, um, they both had multicolor decks. The one that's listed in position one by Oliver, is that Jux or Jugs? 
Um, I believe it's, uh, if you click on his name, I believe his name is Joaquim Oliveria. Oliveira. Sorry, I totally butchered that, I'm sure. Um, but he is a great dude. He's always on Twitter. He's in the Discord. He's always posting some sort of result from a league or a challenge or some brew he's working on. Um, he's a really good, just a great member of the Popper community in general. Yeah. Um, if you look through his deck, it's sort of like this cool Grixis Monarch build. Um, you know, there's just your standard 22 lands, um, you know, all the dual color lands, is it boiler works, the bounce lands, you know, Ash Baron, stuff like that. And then we're, um, I was pretty, I, I mean, interrupt. I was pretty interested in his land package because there's not, uh, let's see outside of his seven snow covered islands, his land package is all singleton as well. Yeah. That's, um. You know, he has the snow-covered islands going, and then there's the one snow-covered swamp, the one snow-covered mountain, just in case, I assume, he wants to fetch something out with Ash Barons. Sure. But it looks like he um, really um, favored the concept of having access to multiple colors of mana, which makes sense to me, because to me, this sort of looks like a base blue deck that is both splashing black and red at the same time. Right. You know, whether that be for good removal cards or, um, in some cases, a few, like, good win conditions. Right. I think um, just from my, just me looking at it from the my, my brewer's mind, um, most of the red, I feel like he wanted to add in the Crimson Fleet Commodore, the Monarch. I mean, we can get to these later. And then just sort of added a few other red removal spells around it since he already had the mana there to do it, yeah. if that makes sense. That sort of looked like what happened. Um, you know, there's you just get access to so many powerful cards as well. Like if you're playing like a blue black deck, adding red. You know, um, he has a terminate in here. Um, a braid is probably one of the best options you can play in um, any format. Um, and then you also get access to probably the two best sideboard cards in this format, I would imagine, which are pyroblast and red elemental blast. Right. Um, blue seemed to be pretty popular, and I like that. A fair bit, you know, get yeah. to play Bonders Ornament, um, and, you know, obviously Bonders Ornament would still be a good card even if you were just two colors, but the fact that it now gets to fix for that third color makes it just a little bit better. Yeah, that's wonderful. I don't know, I, I really like it. I like the idea of Bounce Lands in a deck like this as well. This, yeah, especially when you're running the, uh, the Thriving Lands, mm -hmm. you know, you bounce them back, drop them again, pick a different color or something you have in your hand. Exactly. Uh -huh. And you know, you also have that synergy with um, Bajuka Bog. You can play it multiple times. Yep. Um, and then, even for me, one of the like hidden synergies is Ash Barons. Because you know, you might play a land on turn one, then there might be a play that you really need to make on turn two. Like if your opponent played a really good aggressive creature, or if you wanted to hold up a counter spell or something like that, you could play your Ash Baron. Um, you know, that way you could counter a spell or remove a, remove a creature. And then your next turn, you know, you can make like a proactive two mana play like Augur of Bolas and then bounce back the Ash Barons to be able to land cycle it later. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I was just looking at Mana Leak and, the, you know, if you needed that on turn two, you got your Island and your Ash Barons and, um, yeah, pretty much go about with the way you just said it. Yeah, I like that play. A lot of people don't. I mean, I guess a lot of people do do that. That's not something I ever really think about when I'm brewing a deck. It just ends up in there, if that makes sense. I agree with you. Like, I'm sure that that interaction wasn't something that you had in mind when you put Bounce Lands and Ash Barons into your deck. Right. But it is one of those slight edges that I'm sure if um, I were to have the chance to talk to um, Joaquin, he would probably tell me, like, yeah, that came up once or twice, or maybe not at all. Right. But, <laughs> but it wasn't a uh, driving force behind the brew itself. Exactly. Uh, yeah. I don't normally realize it's there until it's turn two or three, and I'm looking at it in my hand, and I'm thinking, oh, I can do this. Look at that. Exactly. I'm a genius. Right. But, yeah, other than that, you know, his creature package is pretty, um, I, I would say half of it's pretty straightforward, what you'd see in, like, a, your typical blue-black deck in the meta with your Augur of Bolas's, Seagate Oracles. Um, the Archaeomancer is pretty spicy. And then uh, your Gurmog Angler, Muldrifter. But then right there in the middle, you've got these three Monarch cards. you got the Throne of the Black Rose in black, Crimson Fleet Commodore for red, and the Azura Fleet Admiral in blue. 
that's just got to be crippling for somebody sitting across the table from it. That's all I think of when I look at it. Yeah. Um, so I, everybody sort of knows what Thorn of the Black Rose does. For people that don't know what Crimson Fleet Commodore does, it's um, basically three generic and a red for a 5-2 with Trample. And whenever it enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. It's just red Thorn of the Black Rose. And Azor Fleet Admiral is sort of blue Thorn of the Black Rose. Uh, that it's the three generic, one blue. It's a 3-3. Three, three. Whenever it enters the battlefield, you become the Monarch. And it can't be blocked by creatures the Monarch controls. So, and notably, sorry to interrupt, notably the Crimson Fleet Commodore and the Azur Fleet Admiral are both pirates. Yeah. For that fiery cannonade tech. Mm -hmm. That's uh, something that I didn't notice until right now, but... As soon as you said it, it immediately made sense to me, and I love it. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty smart because that is, that is also in his in his spell package. Mm -hmm. I mean, why not? You're running a 60, 60 card singleton deck. You know, jam as much stuff as you need to in there. Yeah, and then, and then the rest, you know, just looking over his spells. I mean, it's just v one value card after another. You know, it's Bonder's ornament, fall from favor, ponder, all that. You know. Everything good in blue or black is in there. Yeah, um, there's deep analysis, edicts, um, good counter spells like counter spell, mana leak, exclude. Agony warp is one of the better value cards that you can play. Um, yeah, for sure. Interestingly, I think the most interesting card that I see in his spell package is probably Grim Harvest, which is a generic and a black. It's an instant that returns target creature card from your graveyard to your hand. And then it has Recover for two generic and a black, which is when a creature card is put to your graveyard from the battlefield, you can pay that cost. And if you do, you can put Grim Harvest into your hand. Otherwise, you have to exile it. So that sort of helps, um, you know, outside of like Gurmag Angler and the few um, Monarch creatures, the win conditions in this deck are somewhat low compared to other decks, I would say. You know, you have a lot of like one power, two power creatures. Yeah, for sure. Um, but this is a way to keep grinding the value you know, like if um, your win conditions do get removed, or even just to get those value creatures back, you know, after they block or anything. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, just looking at his spell package, his ability to monarch, all his draw spells, you know, I didn't see any of the gameplay, obviously, but I wouldn't be surprised if he, you know, ended at least one game with eight cards left in his deck. 10 cards left, you know, it's just that sort of grindy, nothing but value pile. And it looks really fun. Um, I agree. It looks like tons of fun. Um, if you go down to the sideboard as well, um, I think there are a lot of good cards in it. Um, you know, you have Nile Spellbomb, Relic of Progenitus for your Graveyard Hate, as well as Crypt Incursion, which is um, a card that I absolutely love. Um, you have Reaping the Graves. It's it's just so straightforward and low to the ground that I have a hard time imagining that this sideboard could um, never have something you want. Right. On that Crypt Incursion, I think that is a really excellent addition to a sideboard, especially in this format, the Singleton format, because a lot of people um, go wide aggro is very popular. You know, and if you can cannonade and wipe out six creatures and then Crypt Incursion and gain back your essentially your whole life total there's not a lot they're going to be able to do about it yeah exactly um yeah um great job i we were talking this um looking through the past like couple of tournaments this is like one of the few decks that i've seen that looks like a deck brewed for this format that makes any right sense, as opposed to pile of cards you know, sort of thrown together. Not that there's anything wrong with a pile of cards thrown together when there's, um, like, a format so new as this. But this, to me, looks like it could be one of the landmarks going forward. And yeah, I agree. It it does, and like you said, it does show an actual understanding of what the meta could be or what the format is going to be about. And it worked out. Yep. It was great. Um, and then the next deck that I sort of wanted to take a look back, look at was the other one, I guess, that you would say tied for first place. Uh-huh. This one is uh, from Christ Errand. Errand. I am terrible with names. I am as well. <laughs> I'm reading the names is your job, so I don't yeah. myself. 
<laughs> but yeah, he's sort of, uh, you know, Oliver's deck was three colors of the color pie, and this deck is the other two. It's pretty interesting. Yeah. Um, I don't know. To me, it's a straightforward green-white deck. Um, it's sort of like all of the good small green and small white creatures put into the same deck as a bunch of really good enchantments, um, specifically auras and stuff, um, a few good instants. And it sort of, to me, looks like a mixture of Boggles, White Weenie, and Mono White Heroic. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's wonderful. I love it. Yeah, I, I really like a lot of the stuff going on in this deck. Um, you know, Anytime you've got more enchantments than you do creatures, you can sign me up. I'll play that deck. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things going on is the inclusion of Fairy Godmother, um, which is a 1-1 creature for a white, which sort of fits that white weenie. Um, it has flying, but it's also an adventure card, and the adventure costs a generic and a white, and it gives target creature plus 2, plus 1, and it gains flying until end of turn. Um, not only is this part a huge flavor win for people that are into that, it's also just like the adventure mechanic is something that hasn't really hit Popper in a great way. Yeah, uh, but agreed. This, this card fits really nicely into this deck and um, probably had a non-zero impact on the format. Yeah, I would agree. Um, just looking through the list, I would have to say you'd almost all unless you absolutely needed that one-one flyer. You would almost always have to play the adventure side first. There's not really, I'm not really seeing a way to bounce it back mm -mm. to get that later value for it. But it's still either way. I, I love the card. It's great. Yeah. So for me, the reason that I like this card a lot in this deck is it fills both roles of the types of cards that you could play. And that turn one, it's the creature that you want to be playing because it looks like this deck wants to play a creature on turn one, maybe another creature on turn two. Yes. And start pumping them. Yep. So, you know, if you have it in your opening hand, it's the creature you play. And if you draw it later, it's the pump that you probably play on turns three through five or six. Yeah, that's a good point. I guess I was looking at it more of a, if this were a four of 60 card construction list, you know, constructed list. But it's not, you know, how often are you actually going to have that in your hand, I guess, turn one or two? Exactly. Um yeah, if, if you were going to use this at all in some sort of regular constructed format, you would definitely, I would anyway, want, want to have some sort of way to bring it back, whether it's Sky Fisher or, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. It's hard to get in the mindset of the singleton decks, but they're the ones that do really nail it. Right. Um, this, to me, um, <clears throat> just looking at the deck as a whole, um... There's a lot of the, I guess, no-nonsense enchantments, if that makes any sense, as well, where it's like, um, you know, you're just playing enchantments that bump your, that, you know, pump your stuff, and, you know, you're playing, like, a few good value enchantments that also pump your stuff, like Armadillo Cloak or Elephant Guide, um, Serpent Skin, stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so, I think... That there's that spicy i know it's a singleton so he had to find as many cheap enchantments as he could but the uh one of carapace that's pretty interesting i could see that making its way into one of my regular constructed brews it's um enchant creature i guess it would probably say aura nowadays it's from homelands i believe for a single green mana and enchant creature target creature gets plus zero plus two but if you spend zero mana it's similar to an Umbra, I guess. You could sacrifice this enchant enchantment to regenerate the creature that Carapace enchants. Yeah, so I, I like this card a fair bit. Um, something that I think makes this card pretty good is the fact that it buffs the toughness of your creatures. I'm not yep. sure. I haven't looked through the list um, to see if there are any cards that um, bump power only. I think that's where a lot of players' minds go to, though, is, like, if I have to pick between bumping, you know, power or toughness, normally people would probably pick power. Oh, sure. I think in a format like this one, pumping toughness is probably better, though, because it appears to me that a lot of this is going to be, you know, trying to dodge burn spells that remove your creatures or trying to have creatures that can survive creature combat. 
And so pumping toughness, or yeah, pumping toughness appears to be, um, to me, a little bit more powerful than pumping powerful in this format. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. You're, you're probably right. The only card, the only enchantment I see that pumps power more than toughness is the test and training, and that gives it plus one, plus zero. Everything else, it's an equal split or just straight up pumps the uh, pumps the butt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um... This deck is just a good, straightforward, low to the ground, Selesnia Auras deck. Um, yep, I think the addition of the Tetmoth High Priest, I think that's excellent. Um, you've got enough enchantments to trigger them, bring back any of your creatures except for three, two of them. Mm -hmm. But essentially, yeah, you can bring back 14, 13 other creatures. Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, this, this whole deck. It's sort of everything that I'm about. Um, I like looking at the sideboard and seeing, you know, more targeted hate cards. Um, you know, you sort of have, I guess, what I would call the, like, green and white blast. And by that, I mean you have, um, you know, a white 1-1 one, one for 1 that is pro-black. You have um, a 2-2 two, two for 2 that's green and white that's also pro-black. Um, right. <laughs> you have a black and 1-1-1. One, one, one that has pro black and you can pay a white to give other creatures protection from black. <laughs> yeah. It's like this person saw that mono black was probably going to be popular and the most popular color combination was probably going to be blue black. They were like, let's beat that every game two and game three. Yeah. And I think that just goes back to either, either he's played in every one of these events or he was part of a group discussion that, you know, a think tank that brewed up some decks um, but yeah, that's some pretty good choices as far as attacking this specific meta goes, I think. Yeah, and again, that goes back to what we were talking about with the other list in first place, that it feels like this deck was built with Singleton Popper in mind. And right. Um, to me, that's very exciting, because as soon as your format starts to become, let's react to our own meta game as opposed to just throw piles of good cards together, all of a sudden you have something very real on your hands, and I'm yes. not surprised, surprised that these continue to gain in popularity to the point, you know, where you were wanting to host them more than every set being released or anything like that. Yeah. This, these past two decks appear to um, really have the targeted metagame in mind. They do. And you're right. I don't know. Um, granted, I haven't looked at the previous events decks in this much detail as we're doing today. Um but I'd be willing to bet that the first place and second place decks here are the most um, dedicated singleton decks, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. tuned, like you were just saying, tuned for these events specifically. And it, I mean, it shows, you know, first and second place. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then sort of moving on through that, another deck that I wanted to touch on briefly mm -hmm. is um, the third place deck. It was um, went four and one. This is, from what I understand, the like pillar of the format, or one of the pillars. It's yeah, just a really straightforward mono black deck. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, just pretty standard mono black control. Um, from Tiago, I will not attempt to pronounce his last name. <laughs> Tiago, Tiago. Yeah. He's a he's another good dude. Very active on online on mtgo twitter discord uh, he's always down for talking popper you know a lot of these guys play multiple formats they play arena which is a little easier on the wallet as far as um, exchange rates and stuff go that's a whole other episode topic but um they're always willing to talk popper talk brews talk decks results anything you want um they're, they're really a pleasure to have in the community yeah for sure um one of the things about the um, deck looking at it is <clears throat> one of the things that I think probably makes it like, again, for lack of a better term, like the pillar of the format is just mm -hmm. how straightforward all the cards get to be because you're singleton. Yep. You know, you get to play, um, you know, the good removal, hand disruption, you get to play a few good artifacts, and then, you know, you get to play... Um, what is honestly a game plan that you would see in um, you know, 60 card, four copies of everything popper, 
which is good cheap black creatures to sort of gum up the board and work as a more proactive removal. Yep. And then followed up by really heavy hitters, um, both whether that be board wipes or stuff like Gurmag Angler, Sultai Scavenger, um, stuff like that. Is This is a deck that I don't think I have too many opinions on, other than it makes sense that this is the kind of deck that players would sort of circle around to as the de facto deck to beat in Popper. And I think if I had to brew a deck with one deck to beat in mind, it would probably be Mono Black. Yep, I, I agree. Just looking, just scrolling through the deck, it's really tight. I don't know another way to put it. Um, the curves look great. You know, the cards look great. They all seem to serve a purpose. Um, you know, he's even got the one of Corrupt in there, which is a black and five for a sorcery. Deals damage to equal to the number of swamps you control to target creature or player. You gain life equal to that damage. You know, that's in there. I guess in case he gets wiped from a cannonade or if he just needs it as the win con for turn seven, eight, nine, what have you. Yeah. Um, interestingly as well, this um, it's also one of those cards that has uh, not a huge chance, but a slight chance of getting a green and white creature that might be sort of large, you know? Like, if you can survive till turn 8 or whatever, and they have an 8-8 in play, you can, like, answer that. I know that that's probably a really big edge case, and probably not the reason that this card was put in the deck. But that no, but it, it would work. I mean, just look at the previous deck. You know, how big could that, you know, that Laguna Band Trailblazer or what have you, that starts as a 0-4. How big is that going to get by turn eight or nine? You know what I mean? So, yeah, it's a very flexible card, Corrupt, and I'm a big fan of it. I just I think it's interesting that he's got kind of the creatureless plan and the creature-heavy plan going on at the same time. And that's one of the things that the Singleton format really allows is because you've got so much room, you could run two or three archetypes in a deck and still be popular. Yeah. Uh... Or successful, I guess. One of the other things that I like about what's going on with this deck is the the creatures that are sort of annoying for the opponent. So I'm thinking Audacious Thief is um, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3 that whenever it attacks, you draw a card and you lose a life. Mm -hmm. That card can get out of hand really quickly if your opponent doesn't do something about it. Chittering Rats and Liliana Spectre, just basically cards that attack your opponent's hand whenever they enter the battlefield that are also creatures. Um, that's good. Um, of course, you have Gray Merchant and Bone Picker. Just all of these creatures that either also serve as removal or s cards that your opponent needs to get rid of or else they're going to accrue so much value. Right. There's not... I granted, there's only 14 creatures in here, but none of them are just big, dumb idiots. You know, all of them serve a purpose toward ending the game, essentially. Right. Because even the the Blood Burglar, which isn't great in a, you know, your typical four of constructed pauper or what have you. Um, it's a black and one. As long as it's your turn, Blood Burglar has lifelink. He's a 2-2 two, two vampire rogue. Um, he may not be playable anywhere else except for an Epicure of Blood decks like he has down here. You know, it plays it plays that life gain angle as well as creature removal and um, drain effects. There's just a lot of synergy going on, I guess. <laughs> I guess that's the short way of saying it. Yeah. Um, like I said, I don't have too many thoughts about the stick. Mm -mm. But, uh, to, uh, Tygo, great job. This is, um, again, probably one of the pillars of the formats. Yeah, I would agree. And, um, I guess now we can move on to the deck that sort of rounds out the top four. Sure. Um, the best guild ever, Orzov. <laughs> right. Um, I want to say, who played it? Was it Jose Arrieta, maybe? That's probably yeah, how Jose Arrieta, yeah. Ravager PE online. That's how I just know him, you know. Yeah. I really need to call him by his name. It's always Ravager PE if I'm looking for him. Um, it's just your... looks like a pretty standard Orzov deck. Um, to me, it's sort of just a bunch of really good value Orzov creatures that range from bottom of the mana curve to the top of the curve. 
backed up by good removal, good card advantage. Um, I'm really... I want to take this particular deck in a different angle, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's just my... Because I've brewed with with Orzov with black and white so for so many years now, if it's just the way my mind automatically turns. But um, I was scrolling through the land package. Um, it's almost all singletons, bounce lands, you know, Ash Barons, Kabir Crossroads, Mortuary Mire, all that, all the good value lands. And then I saw the one Golgari Rot Farm, and I looked and looked and looked, and there's not a single green pip in this entire deck. So what that led me to was, well, maybe he's got, he's on the bounce plan, you know, um, and he does. He has a lot of stuff that can be bounced, a lot of value lands. Um, he's got this core skyfisher in there, you know, and half of his creatures benefit from being bounced. Um, it's just a very interesting way to approach it, I think. Yeah, so after you, you know, he's got. That. There's also a Rakdos, Carnium, and a Demir Aqueduct. Oh, y y yeah, you're absolutely right. So it appears that you are much more correct than me. Um, that makes me a lot more interested in the things going on here, I think. Because <laughs> there's, I mean, if you look through the creature package, there's only 16, but the top one, Thraven Inspector, bounce, you know, that benefits from being bounced and played again. Lone Missionary, um, Temple Acolyte. Aviary mechanic, all these creatures just give you such value when you play them again and again and again. You bring them back and play them again. Phyrexian Rager. Um, now, I think that's a little hidden tech in here. I'm sure it was on purpose, but um, when you're just looking at it, it just seems like a pretty standard creature, board wipe, hand disruption, black and white deck. But um, looks like there's a little more creative synergies going on than I even first imagined or first realized. Yeah, I mean, because you get to play, you know, the lands that gain life. You get to play Bajuka Bog. Um, bouncing, like, Secluded Step or Baron Moor, which are the cycling lands, seems good. Um, we talked about with the uh, first place deck, the Grixis Monarch, the concept of bouncing an Ash Barons. Yep. And, you know, you could do that here as well. You could reset your thriving lands. Of course, you'd probably always put them on the same two colors. Um, but, yeah, no, I... I I see now that maybe I don't know everything, and I <laughs> did not know everything that was going on around this. You know, you have the enchantments that benefit from being bounced. With that being said, there is one card. Um, well, no, even Ephemerates in the deck, I just didn't see it. Yeah, everything going on here sort of leads me to believe that maybe you are correct. Another thing that I would like to sort of talk about is this card a 64 cards main deck? I did not even notice that. Or, sorry, this deck has 64 cards on the main deck. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah, so I wonder if maybe this deck would have been a little bit more refined, but he just felt like, you know, couldn't really figure out what was going on, or not what was going on, but like the best cards to cut, or what was necessary. Um, that sort of makes me want to go through it and see if I can find four cuts. I think... Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think one of them right off the bat, well, maybe not even off the bat. I was thinking you could probably cut Feed the Swarm, but it does target creatures, and you are gaining life in this deck, so it's not going to hurt you all that much. Mm -hmm. It's just so, another removal spell. Yeah, and then another thing about Feed the Swarm, if um, enchantments are pretty popular, which, again, you saw the Auras deck. Um, I right. There were too many other like, enchantment-based decks. But if that was something that you were considering, like thinking about what could the metagame be, that might be something you want to play. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I don't know. I would have a really hard time, I guess, figuring out which cards I don't like. I really like Disturbed Burial, even though that was a card that I was initially wanting to cut. I like the... Um, I initially thought, well, maybe he could get rid of Demir Houseguard. It's the Transmute. Um, he's a black and three for a two, three skeleton. He's got fear, uh, sacrifice a creature. You can regenerate him, but I think his most powerful ability is the transmute blue, uh, black, black, and one. You can discard this card, search your library for a card with the same converted mana cost as this card, reveal it, put it into your hand then shuffle your library. It's essentially a tutor. As long as you've got something that costs four CMC, 
and I'm looking at it, and Snuff Out makes a perfect target for that. Yeah, so not only can you get Snuff Out, which is targeted removal, there are two board wipes and Pestilence and Evancar's Justice. You could grab your Throne of the Black Rose, or, you know, if you need to get the Monarchy back. Exactly. If your opponent's on the, um, you know, uh, something that I'm just thinking of is, you know, the second place deck was playing the green and white card in their sideboard that was pro-black. Well, you could go with this, get a white card that is pro-multicolor, and yep. in the guild pack, and then all of a sudden you're sort of doing what your opponent wanted to do. Right. I, don't, I would have a really hard time finding cuts in this deck. No wonder the person that built it decided to play 64. Yeah, I think I probably would have too. I don't play a lot with um, Omen of the Dead. I don't know if that could be cut or not, but you know, there's not really a lot of... I'm not seeing any obvious cuts that could be made, I guess, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll now be thinking of this for a really long time. Yeah, this is a great deck. I'm, I'm really digging this one a lot. Yeah, me too. Um, and then, sort of past the uh, top four, you know, there was um, right in fifth place, there was a pretty straightforward Elves deck, I think. That was just, you know, a Singleton Elves deck that got to play, like, you know, your Distant Melody, stuff like that. And yep. That was one that was interesting to me. Um, I think, was it Brindykins that played that one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got the main deck, Rap and Vigor, which is, I think that's a good call. And the Cannonade meta, you never know, especially with the Singleton. Um, I would, in my mind anyway... In the singleton format, if someone's going to splash red, cannonade's going to be in the main deck, yeah, uh, just because there's so much so much room for it. Yeah. Interestingly, I'm pretty sure didn't we talk about rap and vigor sort of in detail last week? Yeah, I think it was my sideboard card of the week last week. Yeah, um, so yep. good job, Rindikins. Um Sixth place was a uh, Raphael playing another Grixis deck. Um, it sort of looks like another take on the Grixis um, Monarch deck. Yeah, Grixis Monarch deck, yeah. yeah. So no surprise to see this one do well again. There are um, a few cards that I'm not quite sure about. Um, Denrova Horse sort of being one of them that you and I talked about a little bit before the show and that, you know, I think it might be hard to get that card going and so you might, in like a control style deck, just want to play Recoil instead. Right. Yeah, that's that's kind of where I I would land. I'd land on the, the recoil plan. Yeah, I mean, he does have the ghostly flicker and the displace and soul manipulation to kind of get Denrova back, whether it's on the battlefield or in the graveyard. But um, that could be like a, a D plan maybe in this deck. You know, he just found a, a third or fourth synergy and or game plan and wanted to just throw it in there, which I'm fine with that. This is a slightly more, I would say, like um, big creature style heavy take on the uh, Grixis Monarch deck. Sure. Um, but I could, there are a lot of good things going on here. Um, I don't know. Was there like any other decks in particular that you wanted to speak about? Um, I know we kind of scrolled through them pre-show. Uh, yeah, and you definitely want to... You know, if you're just kind of scrolling through the, the winning lists of decks or what have you, try to open them up because we noticed that before um, the 15th place deck or the deck that ended up in 15th place shows up as an is it deck, but you open it up and it's really straight creature burn deck, but it has one fire and ice. So that it shows up as an is it deck or a blue, blue red deck. So, um, but no, I think the most interesting and, and creative and intensive decks filtered to the top as they should. Yeah. Um, so again, that's, I believe one of your stated goals of the format, right? Was people that put a lot of time into their brews and stuff like that <laughs> could rise to the top, you know, play unique ideas and stuff. Yeah. It appears to me that now that, you know, sort of targeted meta decks are sort of, um, coming out of, you know, these brew sessions or whatever. It makes sense, again, that they rise to the top. Um, good job to everybody that played. Playing in something like this definitely isn't easy. 
Yeah, and thank, thanks, you guys. You know, everybody made it a pretty seamless um, event. I know a lot of times it's hard to find your opponent or meet up with them if they don't have a Discord account or what have you, or if it's, you know, they're six hours ahead of us or what have you. But um, it really went off pretty much without a hitch, and uh, it's always easy on me. I have a good time just watching watching the results roll in, starting the next rounds, dishing out the prizes. It's always a good time. Um, I, for one, am really excited. The next time one of these are hosted, I've made a decision that um, even if we sort of host it through the like um, common knowledge framework or anything like that, I still plan on playing. And if I do well, I'll um, figure out like a giveaway or something for the tickets that I win. Around. Yeah, absolutely. Same here. But um, this is definitely something that I want to get in on. Um, like I said, I, you know that I've been brewing a deck or sort of looking <laughs> at a few lists, and I would love to bring it and then be able to talk about it on a show one week. But, um, yeah, I think you actually um, got some inspiration from these lists here based on the, the brew that you sent me. Yeah. So that's always good. <clears throat> but um, anyways, I guess... With all that out of the way, I just want to say one more time, great job to everybody involved, um, especially to you um, running something like this. is um, a big challenge, and thanks to, um, is the store called Cards Realm? The site, yeah, cardsrealm.com, yeah. It's um, native languages, Portuguese, I believe, but there's an option down at the bottom. You can switch it to English, go back and forth. There's excellent content there, articles, videos, um, they do a ton of their own events as well. Papa Royale and all that sort of thing. I'm sure you see it on Twitter a lot, but um, yeah, they're just they're, and they focus on every format. It's not just Popper, but I think that's one of their most popular um, content, I guess, is Popper. But they focus on the meta games in all formats and you know spoilers and set reviews and just just everything. You know, editorial pieces, wh whatever you want. They kind of get got everything there. Um, so again, thanks to them. But I guess with uh, more out of the way, we can sort of get on to back to um, four cards or four copies of a card format to get on to our four cards of the week. Quote unquote regular popper. Yeah, exactly. Um, my sideboard card of the week this time around was Tormod's Crypt. Um, I don't really think it needs an introduction. It's a zero mana artifact for basically a one shot exile target player's graveyard. Um, I really like it in the new like mana hungry super linear decks. So I'm thinking of Cascade here. Um, you know, decks where every turn you need to be doing something to advance your main game plan. This is a really great way to interact while still doing that because you only commit a single card and no mana resources to it. Right. I am always honestly surprised that this card doesn't see more play. I don't know if people aren't aware it was ever printed at a common in Chronicles or, or what, but I've always been a fan of it. Yeah. I mean, you can't go wrong with a free artifact. So, especially one that gets rid of just your opponent's graveyard. Yeah. I agree with you. Um, but anyways, what was your uh, sideboard card this time around? Uh, I think mine was influenced mainly because the um, aggro has been showing up a lot more in the online meta as well as some of the decks we looked at in the Singleton event. So I think I just had aggro on the my, on my, on my brain, but um, Gideon's Sacrifice has been one of my favorite cards to at least, you know, sideboard in, brew with. Um, I think it's good against aggro decks. It'll save you at least a turn or two. Um, it, it's good against, if you run into these big mana burn spells, Rolling Thunder, you know, is one that I can think of. Fiery Cannonade. Let me just go ahead and read the card. Uh, Gideon's Sacrifice is one white for an instant. You choose a creature or planeswalker you control all damage that would be dealt this turn to you and permanence you control is dealt to that chosen permanent instead. Uh, and the first thing I thought of was a fiery cannonade coming down. You got five creatures on the board. You just stop 10 power of, of damage. You know what I mean? Um, you saved your whole board. You're going to lose one creature because he'll take it all. But um, yeah, that, that'll uh, that'll put a damper on your opponent's plan real quick. Yeah, no. If you're on any sort of token strategy, it's nothing to to point this at a token and have them take eight, ten, fifteen damage, whatever it may be. Yeah, um, for me, this card sort of um, turns any of your creatures into a benevolent bodyguard. I guess. Yeah, yeah, essentially, that's a good way to put it. 
which I know that you have to commit two cards to it, but whenever you're specifically, you know, wanting to get, um, like, either do well in a really large creature combat or um, be able to beat, you know, the most popular Wrath and Popper right now, Fiery Cannonade. You're right. I think that um, this card's probably the way to go. And it's got Gideon and Liliana on the art, so how can you go wrong with that? Exactly. Um, <laughs> I guess uh, that's going to do it for this episode of Common Knowledge. Yeah, thanks know. for getting together early. I know we normally record at night, but it was kind of kind of neat to get together early in the morning. Yeah, um, for sure. I don't know. I, I like getting together when I feel very energized the whole time. Right. You know, um, not that I don't feel energized any time that I talk to you, but you know, <laughs> it's a little bit more difficult, you know, getting off work and then having to immediately, you know, take a shower and, you know, put on regular clothes to record or anything like that. This no, I, yeah, I hear you. Yeah. yeah. Um, if anybody wanted to get in touch with us, you can find us on Twitter over at, um, for me, Jess Guy Dad, and you can find Brad at popper underscore B, or you could shoot us an email over at commonknowledgemtg at gmail.com. If you guys had any questions on the popper format, MTGO, or just anything in life, again, you can just shoot us an email, leave a comment down below, anything like that. I want to give one more thanks again to our sponsor, PureMTGO.com, as well as the Constructed Criticism Network for letting us be a part of it. And last, but certainly not least, thank you for listening. Take very good care of each other. And never stop brewing. <laughs>